of the Health, Education, and Neighborhood Council Committee. It is Tuesday, August 28th at one, little past one, and we're in City Hall, room 1010. Um, at this point, I want to remind anyone who wants to speak on public comment or any of the, co of the agenda items, please sign up and bring your cards up to the front. At this point, I want to uh, call up uh, open public comment, but actually call up Mr. Herman, who signed up for public comment as well as multiple comment items. So, Mr. Herman, you got three minutes. Well, I don't, I, don't want to... I signed up on a kiosk, sir, not the fucking public comment. Right? So, you got three minutes, two minutes for all your items, and one minute for public comment. Go ahead. Well, now that we don't have a quorum with Herman, Jason Wesson Jr., and Gilbert Cedillo not here yet. I will start with general public comment. Is that okay, sir? Fucking A. Why is it that officers plead guilty to depriv deprivation of civil rights by intentionally making false arrests or trying to touch me in public meetings and grabbing the mic? Cornell Law School has stated that Armando Herman's civil rights under the color of the fucking law in fucking violation of Title 18, United States Code Section 242 is my privilege, protected by the motherfucking Constitution, you stupid fucking schmucks. Keep your fucking dirty, filthy hands off of public speakers and stop suppressing fucking free speech. Trump. So that's your public comment. If you could speak on the items that you signed up for, and I want to remind you if you could uh, keep your uh, talk to the act. Now that we're communicating about fucking access for fucking disabled people, I sure know what the fuck it's like to be disabled. So I have every right to deny any appeal for commission because I am the legislative body of the Ralph M. Brown Act, and I control the floor. I lead the objection of commission of Mr. George E. Acevedo because he doesn't know a fucking thing about 42 U.S.C. 1983 and the American Disability Act under 42 U.S.C. 12101 slash ETSEQ. And then on item five, another reappointment by fucking mayor absent faggot Eric Garcetti because he's out sucking dick with Glenn Date. I object to CD4 for the Commission on Disability for the reappointment of fucking Miss Iran Kant because the cunt doesn't understand what a white face cunt looks like until I object. So now that I know who the white face cunt is, I'm against the white face cunt because that same bitch, like the bitch before her, don't know fucking shit about disabled people, disabled people's rights, access, barriers, and all other fucking shit. So because we don't have a quorum, fuck who, fuck his rape back at UCLA, and I hope the motherfucker rots in hell. Fuck you, who. Thank you, Mr. Herman, and I want to give you your first and final warning. Even before the meeting started, you've been disrupting the audience. Please, if you could keep to yourself and respect everybody else who has respected you as when you spoke. And for those who are first, uh, first time coming to our committee meeting, um, this is free speech. Um, this is the ability where we uh, value our First Amendment. Um, now, be, there's one more person for public comment, and that is Wayne Spindler. Is he in the audience? Mr. Wayne Spindler, we don't see him. So with, with that, there are no other public comment cards, so we, are be, we will be closing public comment. I um, mean, I believe we have uh, the uh, uh, commissioners who are being appointed here today. Are they here? We, they're both here, right? Okay, great. So I'd like to take, uh, while we wait for our other uh, council members who, are, who will be coming, I, I want to take the agenda out of order and uh, hear number four first. Um, Mr. CLA, if you could read that in. Sure. Item number four is a communication for the mayor relative to the reappointment of Mr. Jorge E. Acevedo to the Disabled Access Appeals Commission. 
Thank you. Mr. Acevedo, can you please come on up? Thank you so much for being here today. Very much appreciated. Um, and you know, can you um, just give us a quick background uh, about yourself as well as um, maybe any goals or um, um, accomplishments you want to achieve while serving as the commissioner? Um, yeah, basically, I've been disabled 20, 22 years now. I was a victim of a carjack combat. Lucky to be alive, survived by five bullet shots, two in my head, and the rest around my body. I was in a deep coma for a whole year. Lucky, and thanks to God, I'm alive. When I woke up from that deep coma, I said, I'm not going to let my disability give me. So I used the disability as a crutch and to show people Everybody that even that you're disabled, there's a lot of things you, you can do. One of my past dreams was to be a Los Angeles police officer. During that time that I got shot, I had taken this past it. Um, when I was in the hospital and got out, I decided to conti continue my studies. I went to Glendale Co College, graduated in law enforcement. And after that, I met a teacher who became my mentor. That mentor told me, George, anything that you want, want to do, put your mind to it, and it can be done. So I listened to, to him. He pushed, pushed me with my parents alongside. Lucky to the it's been now 26 years that I'm in the wheelchair and I can happily say I am now an investigator for the Glendale Police Depart Department. I, I've investigated numerous robberies, robberies. I also mentor youth and let them know that education can take you a long way. By me becoming a commissioner, I have taken their knowledge to the city of Los Angeles. I grew up in the Rampart area. One of my favorite spots was Tommy's. I graduated from Belmont. Lucky to say that I've now inspired many of my childhood friends to do 
things and they never thought they, they could do. And that's what I want to take and teach everybody, no matter how hard, no matter how hard things are in life, it's not the end of the world. You can still do a lot of things. As for me, I'm partially paralyzed. I only use one, one hand. And with this one hand, I can say, I can teach many people never to give up. And that's one of my keys, never give up. Thank you, Commissioner Acevedo. I mean, you are the epitome of strength and courage. And, and honestly, I've sat in and I've met um, for many reappointments and appointments of numerous commissioners who presented um, uh, their background and their story as well as what they want to do on, on various commissions. And I got to tell you, that was the first time um, I heard an a, a audience clap. Um, Thank you. So, and that is just, it just shows you are such a role model um, and an example of overcoming um, uh, your circumstance. And, you know, um, and we are proud that you will be, um, you're willing to serve again. And on this commission, um, you are past president. I mean, this is a commission that you know well. We thank you for so much of your service. Um, you are truly an example. Um, and, you know, we grew up near the same neighborhoods, the Tommies, the original Tommies. That's my favorite place. I still go there. Um, I like it because the lines are a lot shorter now because they have the two stations instead of the one. But um, uh, thank you so much. Um, and it's, a, it's very inspiring and enlightening to see individuals like yourself um, not only do what you do in life, but also find the time to give back. So thank you so much on that. And um, I think Mr. Sedillo is also in the room with us. Um, so, I, I could pass it right with me. Okay, all right. So, um, but thank you so much. Uh, we will hold this on the desk till um, uh, Mr. Steele comes back and we'll, we'll pass it then. But thank you and, and congratulations. Sure. Say one more thing. If you guys want to see about my story, I also have a good video on YouTube. And you can look for it. It's called Never Give Up. And you can find it by Jorge VW. And it's all to get the words. And that is my main video that I show to everybody in the city of Glendale and at different schools in Glendale telling them never to give up. Okay, and what was the website again? What, YouTube? Which YouTube again? Yeah, YouTube. Uh -huh. It's Jorge, J-O-R-G, and then follow by V W. Okay, Jorge V W, and in a YouTube channel. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here, uh, Mr. C L A. If we, I know Miss Hopkins is also here, so if we could read that in. Sure. Item number five: a communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Miss Iron C Hopkins to the Commission on Disability. Ms. Hopkins, if you could come on up. Oh, is she not here? Oh, I thought she was. I apologize. Uh, but we have um, Mr. Cedillo who has uh, joined us again. So um, for items four and five, if it's okay with you, Mr. Cedillo, if you don't have any questions, I'd like to um, move it on consent. And I know um, I, you know Mr. Acevedo. He is a resident of your district. Yes. Fine, young man. So if there's no objections, we'd like to uh, move on their reappointment. Yes. So moved? So moved. Thank you. So going back.
back to order. Um, item, and we'd like to go back to item number one. Mr. CLA, if you could read that in first. Item number one is a motion, Sadia Ru, relative to the verbal report on the results of the election and formation of the Historic Cultural North Neighborhood Council and related matters. Great. Um, and today's committee focus will be on the Neighborhood Council subdivision process. We will, we have three council files agendized on that topic. The first is related to a verbal report requested by Mr. Cedillo related to the subdivision in his district. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cedillo and give him the floor, and I'm sure he's going to want the um, uh, Don as well to come on up. Mr. Cedillo? Yes. So we'll have, we'll have the department start with their verbal report. Good afternoon, uh, City Council members, Gracie Liu, General Manager for the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, we are here to provide a verbal report about the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council subdivision um, and some allegations regarding the voting um, there. And I have with me um, my staffer, Mike Fong, who help uh, put together that subdivision election uh, and if you have any, any specific details about the actual election portion the representatives of the city clerk are here as well to provide that information good afternoon council members uh, council member Ryu, council member Sadio, Mike Wong with the Department of Neighbor Empowerment thank you so much to all the stakeholders who came out to our various community meetings who participated in the election who participated in this process with any subdivision, it's a very uh, arduous process, and we held a round of meetings. We also had a special town hall meeting at Castro Elementary School on March 12th with uh, many stakeholders. We also held community meetings on May 2nd and May 23rd in the community. In partnership with the Office of the City Clerk, with Chris Garcia and his team, uh, we participated in those meetings as well. Throughout the process, um, we also verified signatures um, there were over 230 signatures submitted as part of this petition. The department verified 60 of the signatures through email, through phone call, and through a visit at a senior center. And we verified those signatures with those folks who signed the petition. We also uh, coordinated with the Office of the Clerk on a number of outreach and community meetings. And we also had the election on Thursday, June 7th, where the stakeholders of the Historic Cultural Neighbor Council were able to participate and vote in an election we also had a vote by mail process that was open as well. And the election count was 418 yes in favor of the Historic Cultural North subdivision and 43 no votes for the Historic Cultural North subdivision. So that's a brief update from the department. Can I also add to that um, there were no challenges filed for this um, election during the challenge period for um, filing. Anything, anything else you want to add? Uh, city, uh, Chris Garcia from the City Clerk Election. Um, I just want to uh, provide a little more details on uh, what uh, Mike had spoken about. Uh, we did offer a vote by mail component that lasted 45 days from April 23rd to uh, May 30th. Overall, a total number of uh, 367 people applied for a vote by ma mail ballot. Uh, we sent out and verified 324 of these voters. The remaining 43 applications were either incomplete or were duplicate applications. Um, of the voters that cast ballot on election day, uh, 218 cast ballots at the polls and 245 of those ballots were cast by mail. And as Gracie has said, there, was, uh, no, there were no challenges filed with this election. With, through our office. What was the numbers uh, on the BBMs? Um, that cast. were cast were 245. So that's a four, 425 total? Uh, it was a total of, we, we processed a total number of 463 ballots. There were two ballots that were cast. One was a blank ballot and one was an overvote. So otherwise it, the total came out to 418 yes to 43 no. I got that, but on the, you said it was, if I'm mistaken, 200 
votes were cast at the polls and then 225 VBM. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 218 were cast at the polls and 245. Oh, 245. Yes. Okay. All right. That adds up. That's a concern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to a couple of the witnesses. Oh, okay. Uh, Great. So thank you. You know what? When we're going to have um, the comment cards. There are five people who signed up. We're going to call them up first. Um, we have um, Sarah Harris, Michael Mayer, Lydia Moreno. If you guys want to come on up, you guys have a minute each. If you could state your name and um, provide your testimony. Hello, Mr. Rue, Mr. Cedillo. Um, Thank you for having us here and for hearing our comments, uh, Mr. Wesson in absence. So um, I am a resident of Solano Canyon. I have served on the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council for a total of six years. Over the past 10 years of, as secretary and also as a caucus member, um, I would have to point out that with all due respect to Ms. Liu, who I greatly respect and whose guidance and leadership I have found exemplary, and to Mr. Fung, that on that March 12th meeting, out of 500 community members in Solano Canyon, which is part of the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council, 50 of our families were present and made their desire not to be included in a subdivision known. Now, if there were other means by which they could have made that known other than the voting process, which was not transparent or made clear, I really wish that would have been done, done. And for the record, your name was? Sarah Harris. Sarah Harris. Casanova Street. Thank you. 90012. <laughs> Thank you. If you could state your name. Thank you, council members. My name is Lydia Moreno, and I live in Solano Canyon, a small community in Elysian Park. Chinatown wants a neighborhood council, and Chinatown should have its own neighborhood council. But Chinatown representatives at the last minute land grab my community of Solano Canyon. I'm here to tell you the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment failed my community. The numerous subdivision application discrepancies were brought to their attention. Yet the department chose to forge ahead and work closely with the formation com committee, never reaching out to those of us in the communities. Dunn failed to do outreach in my community of Solano Canyon. In fact, two people in Solano Canyon signed the, pe signed the petition to subdivide. This could not be considered outreach. The majority of the signatures gathered, from, gathered came from Chinatown. Over 50% came from one building alone. In fact, 95% of the voters came from Chinatown. Please, I ask that you not allow this neighborhood council to go through. Thank you. Uh, Michael Mayer, thank you all for having us here today and talking about this. I, I think overall there was a lack of transparency and process in this subdivision from day one of saying that there would be subdivisions allowed for this year, it was something that was created for this year specifically to be able to even create the subdivision and then was created on a whim by those Chinatown representatives. And like Solano Canyon representatives has said today, those representatives were left out of the process. Um, watching and being a part of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council, it's really disappointing to see the criteria and hoops that seem to be inconsequential uh, now. Um, and in our last year, this neighborhood council's, you know, spent the last year fighting. And I hope that we can get back to a place where we're actually supporting those communities and where people are heard, where we're not being reactive um, to processes, but done acts as a check and balance and a check that those processes we can fall back on and trust. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, if we could have Laura and Yuval Bar Zimmer come on up. If you could state your name for the record and you'll have a minute each to provide your comments. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I'm Laura Velke for the record. I serve as the third vice president of the Historic Culture Neighborhood Council. Um, a lot of stuff comes before this committee that's false. It's not true. We have provided this committee evidence of 
fraudulent conduct and, and misconduct by their department. 123 signatures delivered on their due date. They added more weeks later. They backdated documents. Um, we didn't file an appeal on the votes because we only had three days to do it. It took three weeks to get documents out of the city clerk's office. So this, <laughs> this neighborhood council cannot move forward in its current iteration. It just can't. Um, Dunn has to be held accountable to the process by which they say that they're meeting. And from our research, they haven't followed any consistent protocol. And we have a right as stakeholders to be able to have that guidance that's written and followable and not manipulatable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council members, my name is Yuval Barzimmer. I'm an at-large at member of the HCNC as well as a uh, vice president. Um, my main concern is really the amount of time that citizens have to waste on this issue. We've been dealing with this very non-transparent process for the last several months. I own a building in Victor Heights. It's one of the neighborhoods in the HCNC. There is about 200 residents there. And for me to hear that Sunday I'm part of the stakeholders that want to create a separate neighborhood council without a single outreach, no attempt whatsoever, and we basically get hijacked by a group of people from Chinatown that decide that we are going to be part of the neighborhood council is just ridiculous. And I don't understand why Dunn cannot apply a little bit of common sense when somebody applies for a subdivision. You really want to understand why they're doing it and for what area and not allow to move forward without a little bit of due diligence and understanding what's, what the issue is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I turn it over to Councilmember Cedillo, I just want to make a quick note here for those who are speaking on the historic cultural subdivision election. I know many of you are asking and have sent our offices email requesting that the subdivision not be certified. I just want to make one process clarification for everybody here as we are not, since we are hearing your concerns, what I want to make clear is that this committee does not oversee the certification. The Board of Neighborhood Commissioners decides whether or not to certify the results, and they have not yet met. Um, what this committee can do, and we are doing today, is reviewing the legislative reforms to the process to address issues like those you are raising today, and those are going to be uh, talked about in item number two and three. But I just want to clarify that for everybody in this room. Um, Mr. Sadil? Yes, um, maybe we can get done back up. Yes, um, so a couple of questions. So there's allegations of signatures coming in that were late. Can you explain that? What's the consequence of that? How does that get uh, addressed or accommodated? Uh, what are the circumstances in which late signatures would be accepted or not accepted? What's the point of a deadline if the signatures are permitted to come in after. So just to mention briefly in terms of the process, the overall process, uh, the department um, is following a process that neighbor councils spent a series of months discussing, which is the whole subdivision process. Um, and when they set forth that they wanted to have subdivisions, they also, you know, didn't want it to be as onerous is actually a, a full-on certification because the whole point was to you know subdivide an existing neighborhood council um, with that we we set up our processes under the subdivision ordinance in which we set deadlines for subdivision applications there's one um, specific sentence which I think confuses confuses folks in which it says if we have uh, more than five subdivision applications will take the first five completed ones. Um, and with, I think with that, that um, statement, a lot of neighbor councils feel like, or the f folks who have challenged this um, feel like the applications that come before us must be completed by the due date. And 
And th that only comes into effect if we have more than five. What we have found with many, many things that neighborhood councils have turned in in the past is um, that the deadline, you know, we usually sometimes get part of the application or we they think they have submitted the full application and then we, as we go through it we realize that there are pieces miss, missing and then we work with the neighborhood council or the formation committee to um, put together the final complete application and that that was in essence what occurred with the historic cultural north uh, neighborhood council application um, I can speak more to it in terms of um, how many, as we started to review the application that came in by the deadline, that there were certain things that were missing. And we did what we normally do with any applicant. We work with them to say, hey, here are some things that are missing. Um, so please make sure you get that information to us so we can finish this application up. So Mike can speak to the specifics of the signatures. So, so the question of, of deadlines is a function of simply processing the work that this question of what's a timely or a completed app is, uh, you're saying to us, is an ongoing process and that apps can be cured throughout the process. That's correct. So then a, a deadline is a deadline for the purposes of done doing its work, but not for the substantive question tied to a sense of what's uh, the substantive question of whether or not people have this kind of democratic right and that these rights are kind are um, are afforded through the through the procedures and that a variation from that is a, a breach of that that's not the position of done right I mean we're always there to support our neighborhood council so when we set a deadline our expectation it's it's literally to help us manage the work and and I, I think in the and, and then we help neighbor councils who might be deficient um, in providing the inf information that we need. I think sometimes governments, you know, unfortunately are known, like their deadlines are known to, okay, well, how can we exclude this? And so, so some folks who have criticized um, us working with the applicants to make sure that their uh, application is complete, as saying, well, you should have just kicked it out. You should have just disqualified it. And, and we just don't work that way. So we work with the formation committee to um, make sure that they have the additional information that they need. Tell me about the outreach and communication. How do we ensure that, as Mr. Duvall said, buildings up in Victor Heights get the same information, the same amount, and the same opportunity to respond? I think a sense of fairness is comes from people having a sense that they get an opportunity to respond. They need notice, an opportunity to respond. I think that's the, what determines a just process, that if people, everybody gets the same notice and everybody gets the same opportunity to respond, and that that opportunity to respond is a reasonable one, right? Not you fill out the app for 1201 at night, midnight, or that uh, they're picked up at in the morning at one site that's inconvenient for other members of the, of the council, other geographically cited members of the council. So tell me about what efforts you did to make sure that there was a sense of fairness in the outreach. So I'll have Mike again uh, speak on our outreach meetings that we have done, but I will also say too that we collaborate with both the formation committees and also the neighbor councils in terms of providing uh, outreach about the subdivision election. Um, we expect that that those representatives in the areas um, that they represent uh, on historic cultural neighbor councils to let their neighbors know that there is this subdivision um, election coming coming up and that if they want to participate they should vote they you know either vote by mail or come to the polls that day there um, there was as Chris noted you know there was ample time to do vote by mail as well as two locations um, for voting one that was dis uh, that was proposed by historic cultural neighborhood council and one proposed by the formation committee uh, but I'll turn it over to Mike in terms of talking about the actual outreach meetings that we, we conducted Thank you, Council Member. Uh, in terms of outreach, uh, there was a meeting on March 12th at Cal Street Elementary School, and we heard from, thank you to the stakeholders who came out today to testify, 
at that March 12th meeting, from Ms. Harris' uh, standpoint, there were close to 500 people at that meeting, including a number of families from the Solano Canyon area and throughout the historic cultural community. We also held community meetings on May 23rd and May 2nd, uh, as well to get word out about the upcoming subdivision election and process. We also, Mary Kim from the Department of Neighbor Empowerment also did a lot of outreach in the community, and we also notified the Neighbor Council and the Formation Committee on March 19th with a letter on all the information from the subdivision application and the process and the ongoing process for uh, the election. And in terms of the election, we work with the Office of City Clerk on uh, election outreach and meetings as well. And the vote by mail process was open for 45 days prior to the June 7th election. Tell me about the, the outreach on the vote by mail process. How do people know? Do they get notices mailed to their home? Is this at this public meeting? How are the ways to inform people that they, part of a person's ability to exercise their right is to know that they do have this right, that they, had, that they know they have this power to, to vote? How did, how did members of the council know that? How are people able to know that? We definitely want to encourage everyone to come out and vote and participate in any election. And in this election, we sent multiple emails. We did the community outreach meetings on uh, May 23rd, May, 20, May 2nd. We also uploaded on our city clerk website, on the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment website, and sent a number of emails out to community members and stakeholders. And at the March 12th meeting as well, we had the Office of City Clerk there as well to talk about the, uh, to let folks know about any type of election process. Beyond the electronic outreach, was there more traditional outreach? Uh, yes. Uh, we had a community meeting at Castle Elementary School on Wednesday, May 23rd. Uh, and we had that there. And then we also had a meeting in the Little Tokyo Arts District area at St. Francis Xavier at Marino Auditorium at 222 South Hewitt, and that was on Wednesday, May 2nd. But how, does, how do people know to go to those, those meetings? We uh, send a number of uh, emails. We let folks know who are interested who came to our town hall meeting on March 12th of the upcoming events and uh, try to get word out through the stakeholders, through the neighbor council, through the formation committee, through a number of mechanisms. So I don't want to be critical, but it seems to me that um, it's just my precursory observation here is that electronic media is the, um, and electronic communications is the primary and almost exclusive way to do outreach. Uh, even for those public town hall meetings, the way people get informed, according to what you've conveyed to us, is through electronic uh, uh, communications. What's that do for people who you know, there's this digital divide in, in our community, in our society. What does this do for those who aren't either savvy or utilize, utilize uh, uh, that, that means of communication? So, so we, that's, this is why we partner with the Formation Committee as well as the Neighborhood Council to assist us in doing further outreach into the communities that they, they know. Uh, the department is actually not funded to do massive amounts of outreach for subdivision. We actually don't get any funding to do subdivision outreach, which is why we do community meetings and we notify folks about community meetings through nextdoor.com. Um, and we uh, have to rely on those partnerships with the formation committee and, um, and the neighborhood council to help us conduct some of that outreach. Um, when we know just from the March meeting that there were members of the Solano Canyon who knew about this, there are, there are families that were there from there uh, from that area, and um, unfortunately, in the end, it doesn't seem like they came out to vote, and that's that's the difference in terms of who can mobilize the people to vote. Um, our our goal is just to provide that information, and and then it's really up to the different camps on who turns out their folks that, that day to vote. So I appreciate that. That's one, one perspective. It seems to me that the other part, the duty, the obligation for the city, though, is to make sure that 
independent of what camps organize or mobilize is that there's an infrastructure in place. So for example, 50 families were there from Salama Canyon for a meeting, but then there's not a reflection of that in voting. So say, if you say four people to household, four, four to families, we're looking at 200 people. If you say five, it's 250. If you say, you know, six, 300. I mean, it's, it, those numbers are significant when you look at the, the election results. Uh, and so what I'm concerned about is did the city and the department fulfill its duty? Do they have and put in place the infrastructure, right? Forget the organizing, forget the camps. That's, that's the democratic process. But is there an infrastructure in place so that people can exercise that franchise of voting. In other words, if we're only communicating through emails and through electronic communications, what happens to the seniors, the more established families, to other people who aren't relying on that? How are we communicating to them? Do they get mail? Do they get traditional mail? Do they get phone calls? People still have landlines? Are they getting texts? Are they getting phone calls to them or the robocalls that come in and remind people that there's going to be this election? Has the city done those things so that there's an equity and a fairness in terms of making sure that everybody, as Mr. Duval stated, that everybody has an opportunity, has notice, and then an opportunity to respond? I think this, this is an issue that's a larger issue, not only for neighbor councils, but for just elections in general. And it's just whether or not uh, the city wants to set aside the type of funding that is necessary to provide such an infrastructure. Um, what we have set up is, is what we've done in the last two subdivision cycles, um, which has worked in, in other areas. Um, and we've, we've been able to reach, um, for instance, in the Westwood subdivision, you know, over over 3,000 people voted, and as Councilmember Rue knows, in the Koreatown subdivision, over 20,000 people voted. And this is, it's this, we have the exact same um, outreach infrastructure for those that we did for Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council. And it really comes down to, again, the partnerships that we have with the Formation Committee and the, and the Neighborhood Council to work collaboratively on a limited budget to try to reach as many people as we can. Um, so tell me about the certification of this election. The next step after a majority of the voters in election um, if they choose to have a subdivision, then uh, the department works with the formation committee and the neighborhood council to uh, to adjust their bylaws and the boundaries. And we will uh, put together a report for the board of neighbor commissioners. Uh, at which point, the board of commissioners, um, their their sole role um, in in going forward is to approve the bylaws and. Uh, for structure boundaries, uh, which is included in that. And after they approve the bylaws, then the, neighbor, the new neighbor council will be deemed certified. So what's the remedy and the process to achieve remedy for the aggrieved parties that have come here to articulate their, their sense that there was not an opportunity for them to vote, that the vote is not reflective of the perspective of their communities, both Victor Heights and, and, and Solano. Clearly somebody took an initiative to create this subdivision, but what opportunities exist for others who may want to create an even smaller subdivision? So there was a challenge process right after the elections. If they felt that there was any type of voter fraud um, that was committed, that they could have filed a challenge at that point. Um, I will note, though, that lack of outreach is not a challengeable um, uh, offense for elections. Otherwise, anyone could challenge an election because this, there's never enough outreach in terms of um, resources. So if, 
you know, we looked at the the neighborhood councils, the new neighborhood councils bylaws. There's opportunity for um, both those in Solano Canyon as well as Victor Heights to to serve on this new neighborhood council. Um, and uh, I don't know if I don't know if the concern for them being on this neighborhood council is that somehow their voice will be. Um, not heard over those in Chinatown, but when we looked at the board structure, it was very clear that they, you know, they have an ability to have equal footing at, on this new neighborhood council uh, with with those representatives in Chinatown. Tell me about the structure that you're asserting ensures a, vo a voice for um, Solano Canyon and Pick Rights. Who has the proposed? The new neighborhood council has proposed a governing board structure that consists of 20 elected board members. Um, there will be th three representatives, which comprise of one business owner, one nonprofit, one at large, um, representing El Pueblo. In, in Chinatown, there will be two residents, one business owner, one nonprofit and one at large uh, for Chinatown. Solano Canyon will have two residents and one business or nonprofit representative. Victor Heights will have two residents and one business or nonprofit representative. There will also be one at large nonprofit representative, one at large employee, one at large business owner one at-large commercial property owner, one at-large senior representative, age 62 or, or older, one at-large property owner representative, and one youth representative, age 16 to 20. The ones that are at-large are open to any, um, any, any stakeholder who qualifies for those seats, and so they could potentially also come from Victor Heights or Solano Canyon. Uh, these seats are, are pretty well distributed um, over uh, so that the representation is not solely for Chinatown. Okay. Okay. So there's 20 electeds. You said there's uh, three for Chinatown? So far, there's five for Chinatown, three for El Pueblo, Three for Solano Canyon, three for Victor Heights, and then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that would be open to any anybody in those areas if they met the um, the board seat type, which is like as I mentioned before, employee, business owner, commercial property owner, etc. So the at large, the seven at large. Those can come from any any part of the. the That's council. correct. Okay. And the the distinguishing characteristic or criteria for one entity having more than the others is what is the population or what determines who gets. Typ typically, demographic demographics. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, thank you. We're not, uh, I'm not satisfied, and I know that you and I are working to reform this, but I see some uh, real fundamental problems here with respect to questions of outreach. I see some challenges with respect to the commitment of resources. Um, if we're spending money on the neighborhood councils, clearly at the front end, we've got to make sure putting resources to make sure that this process is as pristine as it can be. Uh, because other than that, then there's no point in putting the, the resources in on the, on the other side. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Yes, and this is a working process, and that's exactly what our committee is doing today. I just want to add for the speakers, you know, for example, on item number two, we do add additional requirements for outreach and on amongst many other recommendations. 
for subdivisions. And also for item number three, we, um, as respect to fairness, we are including, uh, amongst other things, instructions for new subdivision ordinances, which include a limit on percentage of signatures that can be collected from any one building or any one location. This may address some of the specific issues that occurred in particular to your neighborhood council subdivision election. But yes, this is a, um, we will be taking up items two and three, which will address some of the issues that you've had as well as other subdivision processes. Um, but before we uh, move this item, there was actually two more people who signed up and as a courtesy, I wanna call them up to, so they could have uh, public comment and that's Valerie Hanley and Angelica Moyes. Moyes. If you could state your name for the record and uh, provide your comments. Sure. My name is Valerie Hanley. I happen to be on the current HCNC board and I'm also on the formation committee. And we did the outreach for El Pueblo, that's where I'm from. And I know that you were talking about doing some reforms and hopefully doing some changes. That may be a good thing. Um, limiting people for voting or, or petition signing you have a lot of apartment buildings that are going up, not only what's in Channel Time right now, but Tremel Crow is next door. Yep. That may be a problem because then you are taking back from the people that are living there to be able to have their voice heard. So that's really gonna be a, a difficult consideration I think that we need to look at. We did the outreach for El Pueblo. I just wanted to let you know that uh, I got, collected all the signatures for the petitions for the business owners myself. So that part of that was quite well known and quite well uh, discussed amongst all the merchants. So I know that you have people that have contested that certain, certain places didn't get re outreach. Uh, she will talk on that point right now. Hi there, my name is Adelica Moyes and I'm also on the board of the current HCNC. And I'm also uh, the primary applicant on um, this subdivision. Uh, for the subdivision. Uh, I wanted to uh, point out, I guess, I guess, say some things about two of the areas. One is on the actual elections. Uh, even if you, uh, first of all, there were over a hundred, about a hundred seniors that did vote for that. And if you even take out all of uh, the vote by mail uh, numbers, uh, it would still res have the same result with the election in terms of uh, uh, more in favor of the subdivision. As far as and the other area I wanted to focus on was outreach. I see my time running out. Uh, we did post and done on, uh, done did require five posting locations. So we have images from when we posted. We also have when we were um, walking around El Pueblo, uh, Solano Canyon and Victor Heights. I have letters as well. Finish up your thought, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry? Finish up your thought. Oh, okay. Um, I have letters as well from uh, all of the areas, uh, people representing all of the areas. Uh, for example, there's the East Side Italian, the Deli and Italian Market in Victor Heights. Um, uh, we've worked with churches in Solano Canyon, uh, various groups in all of the areas. Thank you. Thank you. See, there's no more public comment. I'd like to move on to items two and three to discuss reforms that will help alleviate some of these issues of uh, these concerns in the future. And we'll just keep this one uh, in committee. So. If you could read on number two, item number two. Item number two is the Board of Neighbor Commissioners report relative to amending the Los Angeles Administrative Code to revise the subdivision ordinance and related matters. Okay, um, um, for item number two. Okay, no, 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 let's, we'll take that off. Well, yeah, because 
I'd rather continue it or... Okay, well, let's, let's get the uh, department up here. Uh, well, um, so item number two, uh, I, I believe there's a, we have a bond commissioner here present who wants to speak on some of these reforms. Would you like to come up and... Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Chairman Rue, Council Member Cedillo. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Last uh, November, we sent a letter to, um, to this uh, committee with regards to some updates. Uh, the commission, um, based on their first subdivision hearing, realized that it was a very painful process for both the uh, participants and for the commissioners. Uh, and so we thought there should be some changes. We talked about them, we got some language, we went out to uh, neighborhood councils through our meetings, asked them to uh, please participate, and after a number of months, we came up uh, with some language that was submitted to this, uh, this committee. Basically, um, one section deals with notice, and it would be notice to both the, um, the um, subdividers and to the current neighborhood council. I understand that the uh, department is already doing that when updated applications or updated bylaws are filed by the formation committee. They not only uh, notice it to the, uh, to the participants in the subdivision, but also to the affected neighborhood councils, so they're keeping up with that. Um, outreach, um, unfortunately we have seen that outreach is based upon the participating uh, groups. Uh, last night uh, we did uh, the subdivision hearing for uh, Westwood, and there were over 3,000 votes cast. Uh, those were all driven by the various participants. They got the votes out. It turned out that the, um, the group that wanted to subdivide got more than uh, the other by a reasonable amount, and so um, uh, they won the election. Uh, our role, by the way, just to, to clarify, is that uh, at the final hearing, we pass on the bylaws and the boundaries of the uh, subdividing uh, uh, area. Uh, last night we did make some changes in both, um, but that is our, our, our sole um, um, authority, is to look at the boundaries, look at the bylaws. And um, that's where another section that, that I'll talk about in a minute comes into play. With regards to outreach, yes, there needs to be funding if you're going to have reasonable outreach. Otherwise, you're going to be participating on the formation committee and on the, uh, the current neighborhood council or councils. And it depends on who's the most fervent and who's the most motivated as to who gets out the most outreach and possibly who gets out the most votes. That is a simple fact that we've seen and that's what happens. Um, the most important section, I think, if you have the letter there, is um, section C. It's a brand new section. And it puts the commission between the initial application and the election process. Uh, most, neighbor, most people who vote at the, um, at the election think that they are voting on the final bylaws and the final boundaries, but they really aren't. They're actually voting on should there or should there not be a subdivision. And then when it comes to us, that's when the final boundaries and bylaws are decided. What the commission decided was that someone, someone with responsibility, should be placed between everyone, look at the boundaries, look at the bylaws, take testimony, make a decision on whether or not things should be changed before the election so that everybody knows precisely what they're voting on. Plus one very radical recommendation, and that is that the commission could reject the application, and that could be based upon the fact that it did not fit within the um, purview, within the, the structure, within the um, philosophy of neighborhood councils. So that's another thing that could occur with this amendment. Um, the, uh, the next would be with polling places, and the department has already uh, gone to the point where they have polling places in both the subdividing area and the, um, the uh, other neighborhood council or neighborhood councils, so that people can't complain that they had a long ways to go to the, um, to the polling places, plus they have vote by mail. Those are the substantive changes we would like to see happen. 
with regards to that. Um, I think, and we thought, that especially putting the commission between everyone prior to the election would give people the chance to air their grievances, perhaps even work things out, and at the very least come up with boundaries and compromises that everybody could live with rather than us being basically hogtied because for the most part the boundaries and bylaws are already decided. Um, that's, where we, that's where we are. That's what we're recommending. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer, and thank you for a lot of a lot of your work. You and your fellow commissioners work on this. Um, and for the record, that's Commissioner Leonard Schaefer. Um, thank you so very much. Um, before we uh, discuss on this item, I want to also call some of the other public comment cards that have been signed up for this. Could I get Lydia Moreno, uh, Michael Mayer, and Laura to come on up? And you guys got a minute each. Go ahead. State your name. Thank you, Lydia Moreno. Um, I'm very grateful for all the new rules that were enacted into this particular motion, and as well as the commissioner just mentioned. One of the things that I would like to point out is that that we are not recognizing is that one of the problems that we we are having in our existing neighborhood council is the same formation committee that is sitting on our board right now and is being allowed to vote on our existing neighborhood council. Therefore, they're, in a sense, hijacking our existing neighborhood council. So our voice means nothing right now because they have built alliances with other communities so that their communities can, can get what they want. Um, thank you for that 10% not coming, coming from one building because that is exactly the problem that we have, that we have in our application. Actually, that's, item, that's the next item, but uh, okay. thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, thank you, council members, uh, Laura Velke. Uh, I think the biggest issue here is process. Um, we keep talking about outreach. I think outreach is important, um, but Dunn has demonstrated over and over again that they're incapable of doing proper outreach. Most of the outreach comes from the neighborhood councils. So it's very clear to us that no outreach was done by the formation committee as was part of their task. Um, from a funding equity standpoint, um, the funding of, of the subdivisions makes no sense. Um, there has to be a process by which stakeholders, board members, and voters can follow. It has to be very clear and concise. Tonight, uh, Ms. Liu is trying to find a way to undo the vote we took on our bylaws that were approved mm. and voted on uh, by 14 to 10 vote but is looking for a way to cure a Brown Act violation that we filed as an excuse to remove that. This is what we're dealing with on a daily basis, and it is abundantly clear that they are not following any kind of protocol and making this up as they go. Thank you. Uh, Michael Mayer again, but by the way, Arts District Business Representative on HCNC. Um, first and foremost, deadlines should not be negotiable. Um, if there's one thing the government does well, it's deadlines, and this is necessary for fairness and objectivity. When all of you submitted your petitions as, as council members, they clo the city clerk closes the door at 5 p.m. Doesn't matter how many you have. Um, I think that's first and foremost needs to be objective that way. Second, subdivision guidance and information was directed to and support was provided to the subdivision committee, not the neighborhood council. The, throughout the process of when the subdivision was uh, provided and then all follow-up, the subdivision committee was given advice and, and support, not the neighborhood council. Um, and then third, even, and just to, uh, what was said before, if the subdivision is approved, current board has no say in the bylaws um, of the new neighborhood division, but the subdivision committee is able to vote on the remaining neighborhood council, which I think is definitely a conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Could I get General Jeff, Sarah Harris, Caroline Smith, Sim? Ladies first. Thank you. 
Thank you, General. Okay, I'm Sarah Harris. Thank you for a second opportunity to, uh, to speak. I would just like to thank um, Commissioner Schaefer for his pointing out of the possibility that um, a total rejection of application based on the philosophy of the NCs might be considered. Because frankly, um, Ms. Liu, your assertion that demographics would dictate representation I think is actually outside of the philosophy of the neighborhood councils. Um, I do believe that in a situation like we are in in Solano Canyon, we sprawl the 110 freeway, we are in Elysian Park, and we have a foot in Chinatown and Lincoln Heights, frankly, across the river, the confluence, the Los Angeles State Historic Park. Um, the tyranny of the majority shouldn't dictate democracy, and I do believe that I think it is incumbent upon Dunn to consider that as they move forward, whether or not it impacts the decision made in my neighborhood, you'll have to contend with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Caroline Sim and Valerie Hanley. Hanley? Okay, sure. If Valerie Han Han Oh, I'm sorry, General Jeff, I'm sorry. <laughs> you are so polite that, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No problem, sir. General Jeff, I'm the chair of the Skill Neighbor Council Formation Committee. Um, and while we have a litany of issues with the entire subdivision process, um, we really don't want to speak to all of those today. We have pending litigation we think speaks for us. But I did want to speak today to uh, respond to uh, uh, what uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Schaefer has put forth in terms of reforms. Um, there's an issue where um, the process, the way it is now, um, is in the best interest of, of small uh, uh, underserved communities such as Skid Row. Um, if the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners is put in between, uh, that would create a filibuster type of a uh, uh, culture to where uh, certain applicants would not be able to move forward. And so we feel that uh, in the spirit of preserving the American democratic process, that the, uh, the process should remain as it is so that any community can put forth an application and then it is uh, vetted on the back end. Thank you. Valerie? She had to run back to work. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, item number two, I've reviewed uh, Bonk's proposed changes and I agree with, the, uh, with them for the most part. The next item on the, agenda, uh, on the agenda will propose to even go further. However, these proposed changes are well thought out and sensible, and I really want to thank all the commissioners, the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners. What I would like to do is move them forward, but with the substitute version I have distributed, so which are available in the back. Um, the substitute version moves forward with the vision of the board, but with some changes to account for some of the feedback my office has received from city staff and the city attorney's office. In particular, the change that includes 10,000 minimum resident minimum for subdivision addressed in item three today, and some language adjustment to ensure the policy is internally consistent. So um, uh, we've satisfied all public comment, and I'd like to uh, move this item. Uh, seconded by Councilman Sadil, thank you. Um, well, before we go to item number three, I just want to make sure Mr. Wayne Spindler is not in the audience. So um, if, if it's okay with you, Mr. Sadil, I'd like to move um, item 6 to 11 on consent. So moved. Thank you. So item number three, uh, if we'd like to Hi. move, it's the motion related to proposed reforms on subdivision. Mr. Powell? Item number three, a motion, Rue Sadio, relative to reforms and the neighbor council subdivision. Thank you. And the subdivision process was approved by the city council years ago based on requests from neighbor council members who wanted a way to subdivide the current neighbor councils that they felt that were not representative. Though it's very important to maintain a process for enabling community, communities to determine their own destiny, we have seen, as we have seen today, a number of issues arise during the subdivisions this year and last year. My motion aims to make subdivisions less frequent, less divisive, and less burdensome on city staff and the communities that they serve. So colleagues, um, thank you for all of your work uh, and input on this revision. And having fully vetted this issue, I am ready to move this motion forward. Um, uh, but unless you have any questions, Mr. Sadio? This is going where next? City Council. Does it go to the City Attorney? Uh, it already, uh, yes it does, for a final, after what we voted on Council. You know, I, I see the uh, restrictions on uh, 
subdivision petitions within buildings, right? And I am concerned that that may not be constitutional. Seems like it may be a question. Uh huh. You're referring to the petitions, right? Mm hmm. If you'd like, we could pull that um, and, and table that so we could take that one particular item from the motion on another day. That'd be fine. Okay. Uh, but before we make those amendments, and I have an amendment of my own as well, uh, there's several public comment uh, speakers signed up. So if I could have Lydia Moreno, Laura, and Sarah Harris come up, come forward. Here we are again, my one minute turned into three. Um, I'm Sarah Harris from Solano Canyon, represented by the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council still. Um, I would actually like to support less frequent, less divisive, and less burdensome uh, subdivision process. I think that that's in everybody's best interest. I also think that perhaps the money and effort and energy that has been spent on the process of subdivision could better be spent on outreach so that people understand what their neighborhood councils are, why they're there, and in what way people's voices can be elevated, especially when it comes to city planning and land use, and also our interface with state government, um, Cal EPA, for instance, AQMD, CEQA. These are things that people don't understand in the face of tremendous changes in our city. And I think that you'd be um, very happy to see that there'd be a lot less pushback against housing for the homeless if people were to understand how they could use their neighborhood councils as a vehicle for a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia Moreno again, Solano Canyon. Um, I support this and um, not only do I support it, I, if it's possible to make it retroactive, it'd be wonderful for us, of course. Um, Councilmember Cedillo, that 10%, I, I believe, is, is something that would be beneficial uh, because it affected this existing neighborhood council subdivision because over 50% of the signatures in our subdivision came from just one building. And I believe over 50% of the votes also came from one building. Right. So it, it, you know, when you when you have one community that is driving a subdivision, they pretty much can control the, the, the entire process. Um, so it's I understand that and I appreciate that, but the, the franchise, I'm concerned about a, a, a general policy, not the specifics or the results. Sure. The, the, the premise here is that the franchise to vote belongs to everyone, so it's not determined by where you live. And so what the, the underlying premise on the restriction here is that if you live in an apartment building, then your franchise is limited. You would get one-tenth of that vote because only 10% can participate. That concerns me because we have a district, Solano Canyon is one part of CD1, but we have other parts like in the Westlake area and other parts of our community where we have density that's comparable to Manhattan. We have large renter communities. And so what we're suggesting here is that we're, we're going to structure a, a voting policy that is restrictive to people who live in apartments and in uh, multi-unit housing. And so that is anti-democratic. Anti it is structurally anti-democratic because if I live in a multi-unit housing complex, my vote or my potential to vote is restricted. If 10% of my building votes, and I have an opinion that's different from that, my franchise is eliminated. And so 90% of that building, their franchise is, is eliminated. And so I'm concerned about that structure of that. This is a, a, a policy that should be a policy that has as its premise one person, one vote. This structuring, el by design, eliminates one person, one vote. So. If I'm a homeowner and I live down the street in Pico Union, one person, one vote. Right. If I live in a multi-unit complex, one-tenth of a vote. And so I don't think any of us support that. I think all of us would abhor that. And so that's why I'm concerned about it, independent of the results here, independent of looking backward, 
what I'm doing is looking forward to seeing how we can make this fair for everyone. And that's why much of my attention is on, as we heard earlier, notice, opportunity to respond, the obligations of the city to make the franchise effective, reasonable, and just results. I don't think that a structure that restricts people who are tenants, landlord, uh, rent renters, uh, is by design going to result in a, a, uh, the respect afforded one person, one vote. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, I'd like to actually riff on that for a minute with you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I think the issue, the bigger issue, is how the stakeholder is defined. Um, the stakeholder definition can be changed today if you guys decide to do that. Um, we, the, the city charter talks about live, work, and own property. It doesn't talk about community stakeholder. That was added to the administrative code. So you guys can get rid of that. Um, I think the focus on these should be the funding equity before anything moves forward, and we just put a halt on it. I don't see the rush to, to change that, and I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that's a valid point, but I don't think any of us want to stop people from voting. We just want it to be fair and equitable. Um, and I think that a lot of, by putting real process in place on how this should roll, and I'm happy to sit with any of you, and there's a bunch of us who've been working on this pretty hard that are w willing to sit with any of you to talk about what that looks like. We're in the weeds. Mm -hmm. We're at those polls. We're at those elections. We're talking to those stakeholders. We can actually help you get it done and, and do something really real and, and beneficial to the city. Sorry. You, you guys could have a conversation afterwards, but this, we have to be equal, fair to everyone I have eight here. eight seconds left. <laughs> she did. Give her eight seconds left. Let her finish her thought. Sure. <laughs> Unless I misunderstood that 10% is saying that, 10 that no more than 10% of the signatures can come from one building, not that you're restricting it by 10%. Did I misunderstand? Yes, it is based, it is not a voting, it is uh, for the petition process, but in any yes. case, uh, you know, uh, just to clarify, we don't, we don't want to have a back and forth here. We could discuss with you afterwards. Thank you. I think Councilmember Cedillo wants to pull it just to double check with the city attorney, which yes. is not a bad thing to do on the legality because this is a very intensive issue. Um, so um, I am willing to um, uh, con and concede to my colleague here because he wants to have extra eyes see it. So, we, so it is important to, to double check on the legality. So that's what we're going to do. Thank you. And we'll have Thank more you. time to discuss. Um, Thank and, you, Councilman. And as far as the stakeholder process, that will be another, uh, it will be held for another day where we'll have robust discussions on that. And I know people citywide are very interested in, in the stakeholder definition. But could I now also have Mr. Chang Lee, Patricia Kim, and Caroline Sim come on up. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Councilman Sudio and staff, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Chang Lee. I'm representing Korean American Federation. Um, I'd like to state that I support uh, this um, subdivision, so subdivision reform. Uh, our community has gone through recently a uh, subdivision uh, election, <coughs> as you know, and um, you know we're, we're caught by surprise uh, because the the current process has a lot of holes. Uh, I want to particularly speak on the uh, bond involvement board of neighborhood council that the council, uh, uh, the commissioner has just spoken about. Uh, we support that. We think the bond should be involved in the process, not as the uh, uh, at the end uh, certifying the process, the election, but in the beginning to get involved so that there is a uh, community hearing. Uh, there is a uh, uh, you know, checks and balance uh, procedures that reviews this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Council Members. My name is Patricia Kim, and I'm here to uh, be in support of um, Council Members uh, reuse a motion for changes for the subdivision application process. Um, I'd like to just mention that it does cover most of our concerns. As you know, uh, WCKNC went through a very large uh, election process, which could have been um, prevented had um, there, these motions been in place 
prior to. Um, the, I just wanted to note to the public also that the interim president of WCKNC was the main applicant. And uh, no one on the neighborhood council actually knew about it. Um, well, to our understanding, so we see that there's no transparency. And there's also, uh, there was also no opportunity to respond and to have some resolution. Um, so yes, if Bonk was also involved, they could have, yeah. Wow, one minute's quick. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Caroline Sim. I'm a Koreatown Community Impact Stakeholder. And i um, so excited about the results of the last subdivision election and WCKNC because uh, I think it was a historical moment with over 30,000 vote by mail registrants and over 20,000 votes. Um, so it cost the city a lot of money. Based on our calculations, it was almost $100,000 based on staff and material time and, or costs. And it cost a lot of man hours for the community as well. But um, the positive of that was that it just activated our community and it's engaging new, new blood into this process. Uh, I'm in support of the uh, proposed motion. Uh, it addresses most of the issues that can, uh, came up in the last subdivision election. And I'm uh, just really appreciative of the, the neighborhood council commissioners as well as the city council members who have had uh, multiple discussions about the lessons learned from this. And I'm hopeful that um, even though the city is full of diverse communities ranging from Skid Row to Porter Ranch, um, this policy can address or be better than it was. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have Valerie Hamley come on up. Oh, she left, right? So thank you and uh, appreciate all the public for coming and all the neighborhood council members, our board of neighborhood commissioners, as well as all of our DUN staff for coming for these um, um, many overhauls of our system. Um, this is the beginning of a lot of reforms that we are looking into and that we're working collaboratively with, with the communities, with the neighborhood council members, current previous uh, members as well as our Board of Neighborhood Commissioners and everyone else, done staff, city clerk, city attorney, all the council offices who are very vested in this process. So um, this is the first of many discussions we're going to have. Um, so um, I'd like to um, send this forward, but with two, two small changes. Um, the change to amend the overall instruction to instead request that the city attorney draft an ordinance enshrining these rules in law as opposed to asking Dunn to adopt them as a policy. So that's one small technical correction, as well as we'd like to remove um, the required subdivision petitions uh, requiring the 500 signatures um, so we could have a second opinion from the city attorney. So we'll move that, remove that from the uh, amendment and keep that from the motion and keep that in committee. So, um, any other questions, Mr. Good. Okay. So we will move that forward to City Council. Voting rights. Thank you so very much. And I believe there is no other business before us, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you to all the departments and especially the concerned citizens for coming here today.